it's 3 p.m. on uh, my clock. So we're very ha happy to have uh, Yupan from MIT speaking today on augmentations and exact Lagrangian surfaces. So take it away. Um, I hope you can see my screen right now. Um, not yet. No, it doesn't seem like so. Hold on. <laughs> Um, okay. All right. Now I can see my screen. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for the um, introduction. Um, pretty happy to be here. Uh, sorry who were at my talk last week. Uh, because a lot of uh, the content there will be repeated here. Um, all right, this talk is about uh, augmentations and exact Lagrangian surfaces. This is a joint work with uh, Capovilla, Zero, Ligot, Limousino, Murphy, and Trainer. Uh, we got this project from a collaboration workshop called Women in Geometry, happened last summer. Um, it was a pretty good experience to work in a group of um, uh, female mathematicians, and uh, the project was quite interesting. All right, um, I guess the plan is like, I will uh, first talk um, about some background about like Lagrangian mass and Lagrangian surfaces. And then I will point out the uh, main questions we focused on in this talk and um, go from there. All right, so just a very brief catch up of the um, background. I guess in this talk, um, we uh, focused on R3 with the standard context structure um, which is a two uh, which is a two point field given by the one form um, kernel of the one form dz minus y dx. Um, the main object we care here are uh, Lagrangian mass. Well, um, as you all know, uh, these are just knots in R3 that are um, tangent to the contact plane field everywhere. All right. Um, there are two projections of the Lagrangian knot are very useful. One of them is to project it um, like from R3 to the XC plane. These are called a front projection. An example is this. And another one is like a projection to the XY plane. These are called the Lagrangian projection. Um, so the example I draw here are for Anmat. Uh, I will draw another example, which um, is the trophy. All right. Um, cool. So, uh, given two knots in R in um, R three, let's say I have two knots. They are they are lambda plus and lambda minus. Um, let's say they leave in R3. Then um, we can consider some surface in uh, R4 connecting them. Um, but here we want the surface to be um, exact Lagrangian. Um, cobordism. By here, we basically mean it is an um, exact Lagrangian surface um, in the symplectization of R3 
which is exactly R cross R3. And if this additional uh, direction is parameterized by T, um, then the two form we use is like D of E to the power T um, alpha. All right. So we want a surface living in R4 that is uh, cylindrical on top and cylindrical on bottom and um, compact in the middle. Um, so we want it to um, with cylindrical ends. And also we want it has a primitive, like constant primitive on the ends. Um, the condition here, exact Lagrangian, basically just saying the surface is some Lagrangian projection of some Lagrangian surface, and this conical primitive on ends are some like technical conditions we would want in order to concatenate different cobordisms. Um, all right, so uh, when we have such a surface, this is called an uh, exact Lagrangian cobordism from lambda minus to lambda plus. Yes. Um, all right, so that's the, um, the cobordism, like that's the Lagrangian surface we are going to look at. Okay, a main question we want to ask here is that um, given two Lagrangian knots or lengths, let's say lambda plus or lambda and lambda minus, um, is there an exact Lagrangian cobordism from lambda minus to lambda plus? Um, well, this is a very busy question, but somehow hard question um, because the exact Lagrangian condition um, make this the exact Lagrangian cobordism much more restrictive compared to the topological one. Uh, one thing we can see from the definition is that um, the two ends of the of the um, cobordism are actually not symmetric. You know, topologically, if we have a cobordism from lambda minus to lambda plus, one can certainly turn it upside down to get the other direction. But here, turning upside down is not a legal action because it will not preserve the um, sympathetic two form. Um, so we got this asymmetry between the two ends, and that's why we always emphasize the order when we talk about about cobordisms. All right. Um, before um, focusing on this question of existence of cobordism, I would like to say something first about our motivation, like what motivating question drive us to this problem. Um, our motivation um, is from um, Potter Rovish uh, Lagrangian surgery. Um, what this Lagrangian surgery does is like, it tells a way to um, resolve a singularity from an immersed surface to an embedded one. So I should say immersed Lagrangian surface to an uh, embedded Lagrangian sur surface. So locally, what it looks like, um, what I draw is the Lagrangian picture. Uh, locally, an immersed exact Lagrangian surface um, around the double point looks like this, which is, um, let's say two dimensional. So it's like uh, R2 and IR2, um, like two disks intersecting at, um, one point, all right? And um, 
apparently we want to resolve the singularity in a certain way, but uh, before we can do that, we need to impose some condition on this immersed point. Uh, the condition we would like are something like we wanted to have um, Maslow class and um, action class um, being zero. What, well, um, these are just some good conditions. Well, under these conditions, one can resolve the singularity in two different ways. Uh, one can either do this or that. Okay, these are like um, some typical thing you can guess from the from the um, surgery. Okay, um, right. Uh, one thing I want to say is about these conditions, like must of class zero and action zero. Well. Uh, a way I would like to see it is from the uh, Lagrangian lift of this Lagrangian picture. So basically the picture I draw here are some um, Lagrangian picture like this, but you can think of it as Lagrangian projection of some Lagrangian thing. So we can consider it's Lagrangian lift. Um, if I draw the Lagrangian lift picture, um, this one, I will draw it in this way. So I got two branch, but they actually have some uh, common point. This is from here. So um, what these condition means here is that the um, corresponding rib cord in the Lagrangian lift. So in this uh, Lagrangian, in this Lagrangian lift, um, the, the uh, intersection point here will correspond to some, um, will correspond to some rib cord. But here we want the rib cord to have action zero, which means um, we want the immersed point to have action zero, which means the rib cord has action zero. Uh, that basically means the length of that is zero. And um, the Maslow class is zero. You can understand it as this rib cord has grading, um, grading zero, like LCH grading zero. Um, CH grading zero and action length um, zero. Is out a uh, Another way to understand this Maslow class being zero, you can also think of as saying like, um, this is to ensure that after surgery, the Maslow, um, the Maslow number of the uh, surface after surgery is still Maslow zero. Um, so, okay, so I'll keep here. Um, on the Lagrangian lift picture, this is what it looks like um, for the singular surface. And for the other two, one can draw it in the following way. Um, so you can see that, um, you can see from the Lagrangian lift that the surfaces after surgery are all um, embedded exact Lagrangian surface. Okay, um, since the Petrovich Lagrangian surgery um, tells us how to resolve this type of singularity, so we would want to give a name for the surface that only contains this type of singularity. Um, we will call it um, vanishing index and action, well, this is a long name, so I will say VIA filling um, is a filling with um, all double points um, being must of class and action class zero. Um, so that 
um, is the type of immersed surface we will uh, focus on in this talk. All right, so let's see what the surgery tells us. Like, um, the surgery basically um, saying that, well, um, if you have some uh, genus G and I, uh, many immersed point VIA filling, um, we can do surgery to um, to treat an immersed point by a genus. Okay, um, cool. So um, a question we would want to ask is that, is the surgery procedure reversible? Um, re uh, reversible. Or another way uh, I can ask this question is like, are um, all my embedded fillings come from these immersed fillings, like come from surgery on the immersed fillings, right? Um, so are um, all embedded uh, fillings come from surgery. Um, so, you know, if I just draw like a picture topologically, like I, I may have some knot who has some embedded fillings and um, if embedded fillings can come from surgery in certain way, uh, that basically uh, gives a way to relate two different embedded fillings because we can say they come from surgery, uh, they come from the immer the same immersed filling, um, but you just surgery the um, double point in two different ways, and then that's how the two embedded fillings related to each other. Um, or another way of seeing this is like whenever you have an embedded filling, um, if you can find some um, circle um, on the surface where you can just um, shrink that into a point, then this will give you some immersed filling and this one can actually be surgered from that immersed fully. Um, so it seems very possible that uh, embedded filling can come from surgery, um, but we, uh, we don't know <laughs> right now. Uh, I guess another version of it is like easier. Um, it's saying like, um, if a not a Lodrian, um lambda, has a genus one, um, you know, zero immersed point uh, VIA filling. Does it always have a um, um, zero one VIA filling? Means a disc of filling with a one immersed point. Um, if it does have such a filling, then we can further ask whether this uh, embedded filling come from this one from surgery. Um, but first, we would like to ask whether it had such a filling or not. Well, um, I guess checking whether or not has a genus one uh, VIE filling is easy because it's embedded, but checking a knot whether or not has an disc filling with an immersed point is not so um, um, easy. Well, but if we go back to the um, to the local picture here, here we have uh, um, the two discs, R2 union IR2. Uh, if we intersect that with the boundary of B4, which is F3, we will actually get a hop flank. 
Um, so um, here, it, when we are asking whether a knot has such a disk filling with one immersed point, is actually equivalent as asking um, is there an exact Lagrangian cobordism from the Hopf to uh, lambda. Well, um, this is because, well, I will draw this picture. Um, when we have like, um, well, when a knot has um, in, like disc filling with the one immersed point, one can draw a ball, um, like the local neighborhood of the singularity, and um, it can be a double ball. And then uh, we can do asotopy to like do asotopy um, in B4 to change it, uh, to change that singular point into a region. And um, then around that, we know the local picture around the singularity just looks like this where you know your boundary is actually uh, cylindrical over the boundary knot so you can just take that ball off and then get some cobordism um, between like from the half um, to to the knot um, that's how we get to the question of existence of cobordism. Uh, here we care the singularity. Uh, we care like um, only this type of singularity. So we can transfer that question to be the existence of cobordism from half to the knot. But if someone cares some other type of singularity, like who uh, whose local model bounded by a trophial, then having whether it has the that type of singularity surface, you can change that question to be whether there is a cobordism from the trophial um, to the knot. Um, okay, yeah, that's how we got here. Any questions so far? Okay, um, if not, then I will uh, focus on the question of existence of cobordism for the rest of the talk. Well, um, the main, um, I guess, um, the main way we want to answer the question of existence is to build abstractions. Um, and uh, the tool I would like to use, I'll come from um, Chicana Flashbrook DGA. differential graded algebra. Um, again, here I will not touch in too much details, but I would like to brief, uh, briefly recall a bit, uh, recall these DGA things. Well, um, roughly saying when we have a Lagrangian, um, say lambda, then there is a differential graded algebra associated to that, which is an invariant and um, uh, roughly saying this DGA first is a graded um, tensor algebra over Z2 um, generated, generated by uh, Ravicor's of lambda. Well, Rebecor is here, just correspond to the intersections of the Lagrangian projection of the trophial. So there are like finite many of them. Uh, it's a finitely generated um, tensor algebra. Uh, and there's also a differential. The differential count holomorphic disks um, in the symplectization space with a boundary on R cross lambda. So we count like holomorphic disks here, um, probably something like this, right? Um, in the differential, we'll say first we count 
uh, all the types of rigid holomorphic disks. And then we map uh, the positive puncture to the product of negative punctures. Um, anyway, uh, d squared equals zero, you can view this DGA as some chain complex with algebra structure. Um, therefore, you can compute the homology of that. Um, well, since the DGA itself is certain type of single, uh, certain type of invariant, so the homology is also invariant. Um, anyway, to a Legendrian knot, we have a DGA. And even better than that, uh, if we have a cobordism, like say from lambda minus to lambda plus, we, we also get a DGA map from the DGA of the top to the DGA of the bottom. Um, here, the DGA map is just like some chain map that preserved the algebra structure. All right, so, um, so far, the DGA homology and DGA maps, these are a certain type of uh, algebraic invariant. One can use that to build abstraction, um, but the difficulty is the computation. Like, because the differential um, in the um, DGA is not linear, so the homology is like very hard to compute. And then DGA maps, homology maps are all pretty hard to abstract. Um, but one of the computable thing from the package um, is called um, augmentation. Um, an augmentation, let's call it epsilon, of a of lambda to z2 is a DGA map. from um, the DGA of uh, lambda to um, a trivial DGA called Z to zero, which is a chain complex that is Z to at zero grading, but zero at other gradings. Um, this is a DGA map. You can think of it as a chain map that satisfy, uh, like pre preserve the algebra structure. So what it really does is like it send each generator in this algebra, basically each record to a number and then satisfy certain conditions. These conditions like chain, uh, chain map condition just uh, is just a differential composed with epsilon equals zero and algebra condition is just like uh, it maps one to one, certain things like that. So um, to solve like to solve all the augmentations, all you need to do is just to solve a bunch of algebraic equations. You know, with n z two to certain power, it's like super computable, uh, very easy to compute. All right, um, and this augmentation also have a very uh, good geometric interpretation. Like say, when we have a filling of lambda, this can be viewed as a cobordism from amplitude to lambda. Um, by the functorality of the DGA, we got a map from the DGA of lambda to DGA of amplitude. Here is just the uh, trivial one, the ground one. And here you can see that an exact Lagrangian filling really gives us an augmentation. So um, this augmentation as an algebraic thing, you can view it as algebraic extension of some geometric stuff like exact Lagrangian fillings. Um, and um, the way to see this geometrically is like, you know, these um, fill, like these DGA maps just map each um, rib cord to like some number and this number just count how many disks you have uh, with a boundary on the surface. So everything's very geometrical. Okay, uh, we got some something computable, but what is an invariant? Uh, the invariant from the augmentations are this, is this. Um, is the set of all the augmentations. Um, here we want to count it up to DGA homotopy. Well, 
Um, these DGAs are chain maps um, that preserve algebra structure. So we can say DGA are homotopic if they are chain homotopic and preserve algebra structure. Um, okay, cool. Good. Okay, so what, what's the abstraction we got from augmentation? Well, um, we have this cobordism. We got a DGA map from top to bottom. And um, if we have some augmentation on bottom, that is a map from bottom to ground. And and suppose, yes, oh, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, is the opposite true? Every augmentation gave rise to a filling? That is a very good question. Uh, the answer is no. Not all the uh, augmentations come from embedded fillings, um, but if we extend the geometric meaning, uh, like allow immersed filling to induce augmentations, then all the augmentation to Z2 come from immersed fillings, like possible immersed fillings. Good, all right. Thank you for the question. Okay. Um, and we're here to build abstraction using augmentations. So if we have an augmentation, then we got these maps and compose them um, we got a map from top to ground, which is an augmentation of the top. So what all the saying is like, we got a map from the set of augmentations at the bottom to the set of augmentations on the top. And um, this gives abstractions, right? Say if uh, the top one don't have augmentation, um, but the bottom one has augmentation, then um, no exact Lagrangian cobordism from lambda minus to lambda plus. Um, here, all we used about a set of augmentation is like, Amplity or not, right? Whether there is augmentation or not. But actually, we can do further. We can um, count the number of augmentations and stuff. Um, so, the main result I want to introduce in this talk um, it's saying that this map uh, from the set of augmentation. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, Yes, this map uh, from the set of augmentations at bottom to the set of augmentations at top is actually um, injective. So not only there is a map, but it's injective. I want to put some regular conditions in front, say um, that sigma be an exact Lagrangian cobordism from lambda minus to lambda plus with Maslow zero. Okay, um, then this one is the injective. Um, a direct corollary from here is that uh, if we count the number of augmentations, then the top one will be bigger than or equal to the number of augmentations at bottom which is straightforward. Okay, augmentations are taken up to homotopy? Yes, they are taken up to homotopy. Otherwise, uh, whenever we do a rather mass to move, that will create like a rather mass to two move that create um, two repercourse, then we will get uh, doubled uh, yeah, we'll get the number of augmentations doubled, uh, but the two Lagrangians are actually the same. So we, uh, when we say the number of augmentations, we want we always count it up to homotopy. All right, good. Cool. 
Um, all right. So now um, I will show that um, this um, abstraction is effective by um, applying to an example. And this example is uh, related back to the Potorovich uh, Lagrangian surgery. Um, the example we have here is 7-4. Um, first, uh, this the 74 has a genus 1 embedded fully. Uh, you, um, you can see that by doing pinch moves. Uh, oh, oh, wow. Okay. okay. You can do pinch move uh, here and here. Uh, by pinch move, I just mean uh, this. I mean, this is like, mm, this is top and this is bottom. Um, so if you do the pinch at here and here, and that will give you an art and then you can um, get a filling for that. So what we know from here is that uh, 74 has a genus one filling. Um, and we would want to know whether or not it has a, a disk filling with a one immersed point, right? So we want to test whether it has zero one VIA filling. Um, to test this part is the same as asking whether there's a cobordism from the half to seven four. And by our corollary, we just want to test the number of augmentations. Uh, we choose the example well, well enough that this example is super, has like super small number of augmentations. There are one of them and half has three. So there is no cobordism from half to seven four and thus no zero one VIA filling. Um, okay, so the conclusion is that the Potorovich Lagrangian surgery is not reversible and for this particular seven four, even though it has a genus one embedded filling, but you can never find such a circle that you can just shrink it to a zero and get a disc filling with a one immersed point. You just cannot do this. Um, one thing I want to point out is that um, a result of um, Ovens and Zero, um, they actually proved that um, like seven four smoothly um, don't has such a fully. <laughs> so don't have a disk filling with uh, one immersed point. So smoothly, this cannot be done. Therefore, you know, Lagrangianly, there shouldn't be done. Um, but anyway, we here pro provide a different um, technique to approach the question. And I think uh, the, pr the approach itself um, is um, interesting. Um, and we can actually provide another, like, I guess another family of examples where I do not know whether smoothly can be done or not. Um, this example is uh, a generalization of the 7-4. So for 7-4, you can see that uh, these strands go uh, he, like back and forth, like in this way. Um, and in the extended example, we just want that to repeat they happened for G many times. So you got like this part like happened uh, G many times. Then uh, for this example, you can again by doing pinch, you can do pinch here and then here and then here. Um, and then uh, these are like 2D many pinch points. So that means that this uh, knot has a G, um, genus G embedded fillings. So it has a G0 embedded filling. Um, but does any of that genus can be treated by an immersed point? We want to test the number of augmentations and this new one still have one augmentation but half has three augmentations. 
therefore um, it has no uh, G minus one and one BIA fully. You have a question from Roman. All right. Oh, could you say to us uh, uh, how the proof of open and zero goes? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I Sorry, I don't quite um, know how their proof goes. Um, uh, yeah. I should have read that, but sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Um, and for this example, I think what uh, Ovens and Zero, like in that paper, they computed the um, some invariant uh, to saying how many, like the, some invariant about the number of immersed points in the uh, immersed filling. And in their paper, they, they only computed um, some small crossing uh, knots but not for a bigger one. So I cannot tell whether they can do something more general like the example I gave here. All right. Um, cool. Any other questions? Okay. Um, all right. Now I'll go back to this main theorem here. Um, I want to point out that um, this injectivity result was first approved in my thesis for the case of cobordism between uh, single component knots. Um, and right now in this project, we want to apply it to cobordism between links because one of the component is half. Um, but my original proof doesn't work for the case of links for some technical reason. Um, and in this collaboration workshop, we find a new proof uh, that works more generally, like works for links, and I think it's more natural. So I want to spend the rest of the time talking about certain um, proof, like proof to, or strategy of proof um, to this main result. Um, well, to, to prove this injectivity, basically what we want to do is like say, uh, there is a cobordism from lambda minus to lambda plus, and suppose um, we have two augmentations at bottom that will induce two augmentations on top. And we want to show that if the top two are equivalent, basically means DGA homotopic, then the bottom two are equivalent. Um, the, for the strategy of proof, the first part I want to use is augmentation cohomology category. And uh, the main use for this part is to, um, um, is to interpret the equivalence between augmentations geometrically. Um, this augmentation cohomology category is just like, um, uh, well, I guess the original version is the augmentation category. This was um, introduced by Lenny in Rutherford, Shindy Selak, and Zeslo. Um, what I used is like the cohomology version of that. This is denoted by uh, cohomology um, arc of lambda. All right, uh, as a variant, this category, well, this is a category, uh, so we would like to know the objects and morphism. The objects here are just augmentations. Um, and for two objects, say lambda one and lambda two, uh, the morphism between them, how, um, epsilon one and, sorry, epsilon one and epsilon two, um, is some homology of some um, like Z2 vector space uh, with some differential. And what is it? Well, um, uh, well, basically we start with some lambda 
and then we push it in the positive Z direction to get another copy. And uh, here we will push it using some MERS function. And uh, we would like to um, take the rib cores from the green one to the red one. And by a MERS perturbation, there are finite many of them. Um, and then we consider the Z2 vector space generated by these rib cord. And the differential here is some similar to the DGA differential, uh, but you know the boundary of that uh, holomorphic disks may have may leaves on the um, two copies. We got this uh, lambda one and lambda two. Um, these holomorphic disks uh, may have some uh, why. Oh, sorry. Oh. Hold on. I think that. Connection. Um, hold on. Sorry. Um, it just, it seems like I have a trouble in sharing my screen. Mm. Let me see. Where I can do this? Come on. Um. All right, it's coming back. All right, sorry about the interrupt. Um, okay, so we, um, on the negative ends, we have these like pure rib cores like this and here. Um, well, so far in the chain complex, we haven't used the epsilon one and two, the two augmentations here. Um, and right now we are going to use the augmentation epsilon one to augment those pure rib cores of lambda one. Basically, these augmentations will map the rib core to a number. So we'll just, um, draw something like this. And also use epsilon two to map those pure rib cores to number. And now we are left with some pure rib cord on the bottom and some pure rib cord, sorry, some mixed rib cord on bottom and some rib, mixed rib cord on top. And then this differential will just map B to some numbers time A. Um, and uh, the differential has grading plus one. That's why we're taking the co cohomology. All right, um, so that's the morphism. Um, an, another structure in the category is that there's also a product structure. Or uh, you can think of it as composition. So when we have uh, um, two morphism, we can compose them um, to get another um, morphism. And this is defined in a similar way as the differential here. Um, here we use two copies and for this um, composition we need three copies. So uh, I will get three copies like this. Okay, and to define this M2, we will count holomorphic disks uh, with a boundary on these three copies. Um, similar as before, we got a bunch of uh, uh, negative punctures. Um, a lot of them are pure, so we can just use the augmentation to um, map them to numbers. And then we are left with some uh, two mixed one on bottom and one mixed one on top. The top one is A, and then let's say the bottom one here is C and B, and then this M2 will map uh, C and B to A, uh, to some coefficient multiply A. Um, but anyway, this is how um, the product structure uh, being defined and everything is very geometrical. Uh, cool, okay. 
So <laughs> we have to we have been using the categorical uh, language a lot. And one good thing about this um, argumentation cohomology category is that uh, this category is unital. Uh, what that means is like for um, there is a unit um, let's say E in each self home. Um, what this allows us to do is like we can talk about uh, equivalence of uh, argumentations. Mm. Okay, um, so two argumentations are uh, equivalent. You know, these are two objects. So we got these two argumentations. They're equivalent if uh, there is um, a map like alpha from one to two and a map beta from uh, two to one, such that when you compose them in one way, you get the identity. And when you compose them in the other way, you also get identity. So um, that's a um, equivalence relation in category. And um, so far for argumentations, we got um, two ways of equivalence. One of them is the DGA homotopy. And the other way is this equivalence um, in the cohomology category. And the good thing is that they are actually the same. So we can interpret this DGA homotopy in another way using category language. And in this definition of equivalence, all that matters are these maps, like say home uh, space. And the home here are just some equivalence class of ribocores. And those river cores are all like very geometrical. So um, in the next step, we will use raptor fleur homology to relate um, the home of the top and home of the bottom, right? Because we want to check uh, the relation of their equivalence. And right now equivalence just be transferred to some home. And uh, we just want to relate uh, these two spaces. Okay. Um, the, the tool we use is the Raptor Fleur theory, uh, which is introduced by Shantrin, Dimitri Glorizel, Gagini, and Globko. Um, um, what's happened here is very similar to what we have seen in the argumentation category. Well, basically, start from uh, one cobordism. We can push it in the positive z direction to get a second copy like this. And let's say we gave some argumentations on the bottom. Let's say uh, epsilon minus i and j. That will induce argumentation on top um, plus i and j. Okay, and then we can define some uh, chain complex called Cthulhu chain complex. Uh, it consists of three parts, um, makes the rib cord from green one to red one on top, and makes the rib cord um, bottom, and also intersection of the two cobordisms. Uh, so we got these three parts. Um, and the differential is also defined in some similar way. Uh, it's defined by counting holomorphic disks. Um, on this, well, as you can see, it's like in an upper triangular form. Uh, this disk is count on the top, so lambda plus. And this is for um, lambda minus. All the rest of them are count with boundary on sigma. Um, one thing to point here is that um, this vector space with this differential, if we take the homology of that, that will exactly be our home of the top. 
And similarly, if we take this vector space with the lower right um, differential, we will exactly get the hum of the bottom. So that's how we relate the hum of top with the top hum of bottom. Um, what we will use here is that uh, from CDGG, um, it's saying uh, this whole chain complex um, is a cyclic. So the homology of that is zero. And we can get some long exact sequence from here. So some homology of the bottom, some homology of the middle, and homology of the top, they, they are related. And the um, long exact sequence we get is like relative homo co-homology, uh, hom degree k of the top, uh, map to hom degree k of the bottom, and then uh, keep going. In this long exact sequence, we in particular have a map that's called it IOTA from this home of the top to the home of the bottom. Um, what we can prove further from here is that um, this IOTA map. Um, A, uh, well, this map preserve um, the unit and product structure. Um, basically, um, like for each knot, we have this A infinity structure. And actually for cobordism, we should have certain type of A infinity structure. And it turns out like the, the product structure are all preserved and the unit is also preserved. So they're in the very well structure. Um, okay, um, so now we can give a, a proof of uh, the main theorem. The main theorem is about the injectivity of um, argumentations. So, you know, we have these, um, we have two argumentations at bottom and that will induce two argumentations on top. If the top two are equivalent, we want to show the bottom two are equivalent. So the top two are equivalent, basically uh, that's just saying uh, we have a map from one to two and a map from two to one, um, when we compose them together, that will uh, gives us unit. And we want, what we want is like seeing something similar uh, on the bottom. And how do we do that? Well, this IOTA map just gives us everything. Um, we got IOTA of alpha here, IOTA of beta here, and IOTA of the uh, unit will just be a unit again. Uh, and this IOTA map also preserved the product structure. So the M2 will map this one and this one to the unit. And um, to for equivalence, we, we need a like, relation from the other direction of composition and it will get in the same way. So here we can um, prove the injectivity. All right, I guess um, it's a good time to stop. Uh, that's all I want to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Are there any questions for the speaker? I, I guess I have a, I have a question. Um, yes. Right. 
So um, your your, th your the theorem that you you that you prove says that you have this map as an injective. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, can you upgrade the statement to this to this category that you mentioned? Uh, the augmentation category. Um, yeah. That is a very good question. Um, so my my previous. Um, version of this, uh, which is like for cobordism between a single component knot, like between single component knots. For that one, um, we do have a well-defined functor mm -hmm. between the augmentation category. So uh, the result I have is like uh, this functor is injective on the object level and is a uh, um, faceful map on mm -hmm. the morphism level, right. but right now we are move like we move to the case of cobordism between uh, links. There is not a well defined map or like category between the augmentation category of a knot and a link. Um, somehow it's not. Uh, well defined, so um, yeah. So all I can say is about object level. It's like a map between that. Yeah. Yeah. But but there's another there's another version in some other context that you do have uh, faithfulness. Yes, yes. Like when the top and bottom are all single component knots, then I can say more in terms of the algebraic structure. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm unable to put it into a precise form, but still. So we have this uh, kind of bijection between the augmentations and the rulings. And if you have a ruling, you, you can associate it to it a number. So the ruling, the rulings form a, a polynomial. So they get decomposed into some disjoint subsets. And the same, I guess, goes for the augmentations. And is this your injective theorem somehow takes into account this um, this decomposition into subsets by some k kind of number? Um, I, I'm not. I'm not. Um fully understand your question. Uh, I think you talk about the relation between augmentations and the rulings. Um, and yes, we do have uh, some relations about ruling polynomials uh, of the top and bottom. Uh, the but that's also, I guess we got that result from the augmentation set of story. So we got, we first got the injectivity of augmentations and then we use the relation between um, um, some um, ruling polynomial and um, augmentation of homotopy cardinality. Like we go from here, like, from the cardinality to the ruling polynomial and say some relation between the ruling polynomials. Um, but we cannot say too much directly relate to the number of rulings. There are some relations uh, for decomposable cobordisms, like between um, knots, and then we can say something like the top one has more rulings than the bottom. Uh, but when the surface is more general, like in particular not decomposable, um, then I don't know um, many to say. Uh, yeah, I just don't know that much to say. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right thanks. Thank you. Oh, I got a question from Oleg. 
is the number of augmentations always finite? That's a very good question. Uh, no, um, it depends on the number, it depends on um, the type of augmentations are we counting. So in this talk, for simplicity, uh, all the augmentations I'm considering are augmentations to Z2. Um, but you know, like uh, the DGAs can be defined in other um, coefficients. So augmentations can also be um, defined in other versions. Like for example, you can you can just send it to any field f if your dga if your dga um, is defined um, using this f coefficient so uh, when this f is some um, uh, not finite field like say c or r um, then we cannot count the number of augmentations uh, we can only count it when this f is a finite field okay, i got another question from kyler uh, do you think anything like this result could be true if we replace the Lagrangian contact homology algebra with the contact homology algebra of a closed contact manifold. Um, um, that is a very good question. Um, I never think about it and um, I don't quite no, I think like uh, the quantum homology algebra for a closed quantum manifold is much more complicated than the Lagrangian quantum homology. That's why um, I yeah I don't quite know whether there's like um, something similar to augmentation in that setting and whether it's easy to compute um, as like it may not be as easy to compute as here, but I don't I don't even know whether there's such a notation or not. Um, yeah. See, I, I had just a notational question. Oh, sure. Um, when you were inter introducing how to interpret when two augmentations are equivalent geometrically, mm -hmm. what, let's see, what's the difference? So up, up one slide from that one. Okay, this one? What's, what's the definition again of this, the, uh, this epsilon one, like, you, the augmentation is when the one is a subscript, and then in the picture you have it where it's a superscript. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> They're the same. Yeah, I should do super. Yeah, I, I shouldn't do this one. I should do this. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I should be more careful about my notation, or I should change the lower one. Okay. Anyway, yeah. So the epsilon one is a map to Z2 and mm -hmm. can you say again what that picture is depicting? Okay, uh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, where is that? <laughs> sorry, what is your question? Sorry. What, what that picture is depicting? Um, you mean this one or this one? The first one. The first one, I see. Um, so uh, for the first one, um, for this one, I mean, um, I'm counting holomorphic disks where the boundary on the um, lambda one union lambda two. So the boundary could, um, you know, this 
the, yeah, what I draw here is a holomorphic disk. And the boundary of it has some part in lambda one and some part in lambda two. Um, this disk has one positive puncture A and maybe multiple uh, negative punctures. Uh, among these negative punctures, it can, you know, like one part of the boundary is like in lambda one and one part of the boundary is in lambda two. So there's like only one mixed rib cord where it can jump from lambda two to lambda one. And the rest of them are all stay in lambda one or stay in lambda two. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then I will use the augmentation epsilon one to map those like a rib cord from lambda one to lambda one to some number because uh, the augmentation is a map that mapping rib cords to number that, and satisfy certain relations. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any more questions for the speaker? Okay, well, if not, let's let's uh, thank Pan again. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much for the, for attending the talk.